so thanks for coming back, those who've managed to make it back. Um, we've got an hour to give you a, a whiz through um, the digital tour, tour of the, the, the tour of the virtual tour of We Are Commoners exhibition. So I'm Deirdre Figueredo, I'm the director of Craftspace and my colleague Emma Dacre uh, from Craftspace is here with me and we've um, co-curated um, this exhibition together um, with support from um, the network, particularly Leila Dorney uh, and Amy Twigger Holroyd, who's um, also on the call. Um, so um, we'll make a start, Emma. We haven't got long with each uh, maker, we've got 16 artworks to get through so it's just going to be you know very brief sort of whiz through and then um you, you're welcome to go and see um visit the virtual tour yourself and peruse a bit longer there's a lot of content on there there's audio clips that we're not able to play tonight um there's video that you know that there's all sorts of pictures and writing and all sorts of things so please do uh, revisit it and um you know, see the exhibition in person on its tour, uh, if you can. Um, so this was the exhibition, uh, or is the exhibition at Oriel Davis Gallery in Wales. And um, uh, here you, you enter into the gallery here, uh, the introduction. And so in terms of um, an introduction, um, we sort of invite people to, uh, the visitors that come in to become or recognize themselves as a commoner. And partly we were um, kind of uh, the reason for the exhibition coming about sort of about maybe eight or 10 years ago, really, in, in its inception was around um, being in Birmingham where we are and, and the increasing privatisation that we were seeing, um, gentrification of Birmingham, particularly the area that we, our offices were in and we actually got thrown out of, of the building that we were in because of gentrification. And so we began to see encroachments really and enclosures into public space and public life with increasing amount of the city being um, privatized and, and not feeling like it could be commoned very easily or very well. And that sort of sparked a, a bit of a protest on our part and the political will to think about how craft um, could address or, or, or highlight um, a kind of um, a counterpoint to the experiences that we were having. And so, um, you know, the, and we felt the impact of all of this and the impact of austerity has served to erode the commons really. And um, we discovered then Peter Line about um, a word activating commons as a commoning. So activating it, making it a verb was exciting to find out about. And we felt that that was really a way of renewing public life to think about commoning, future commoning, and um, common, commons is always coming into, it's always becoming. And so there was an exciting opportunity to present craft as something that could um, become a form, it is a form of commoning and become a form of commoning. So really in the exhibition, um, the um, skills and materials here provide um, a means to common or they use to give insight into examples of commoning. So the first person we'll start with is Jackie Oliver. Um, and um, oh, I forgot to say that there are three themes to the exhibition. Um, healing, claiming and cooperating are the three themes. And um, around healing, it, it's linked to performing um, acts of mutual care and repair between ourselves, you know, in public spaces and in a natural environment. Um, claiming is about different actions that commonly, where it's made possible to sort of claim and, and reclaim craft skills, ancient wisdom, rituals, voice, fashion, spaces, resources. And, um, and also that showing that there are kind of enriching ways to, to own, um, different ways to own. And um, cooperating is, well, I mean, you know, cooperating is a key part of commoning and, and it is about that social um, cooperation to get things done. Um, so back to Jackie Oliver, who's the first um, artist. And Jackie, um, she worked in collaboration with Bees and Refugees in London, founded by Ali um, Alzheim. 
and it's a charity that protects honeybees. And so they worked with each other and Jackie sort of gave sculptural form really to thinking about borders, displacement, um, and using um, testimonial from Ali and, and his group of um, beekeepers in London um, to think about how they use commoning as, um, how they use beekeeping as a way of, of commoning together and a way of finding a, an, an identity in a new home. And um, we've got a little piece of audio that um, shows uh, where Jackie talks a little bit more about the work, which we thought we'd play for you. The journey of arriving at this piece was a, a, a really long journey, as uh, you know, longer because of lockdown. But I initially was going to look at community gardens. And while I was waiting, different community gardens said that I couldn't visit them, I didn't have any volunteers. And I was reading a book at the time, Beekeeper of Aleppo, and I just looked at the back and there was an organisation and I thought it'd be really nice once I'd finished this project to contact this organisation. And then a couple of days later, one of the community gardens that I had contacted, Hammersmith Community Gardens, posted a post about Ali and bees and refugees. And I'm going to let him talk about his organization, which is fantastic. First of all, thank you so much for inviting me here. I know I'm not an artist, but it's uh, it's truly an honor to be with you and also to, to inspire such a brilliant artist like Jackie. I'd like to start by just sharing a bit of my story so you have, can, so you have a bit of a context uh, of how did Jackie get to express and make that beautiful these beautiful pieces? I come from uh, Damascus, the, the capital of Syria. I lived there until 2013, and the government forces cracked down on peaceful protesters. And due to our support to civilians besieged by the army, the government ended up burning down our factories and our our home. I used to work in the fashion industry and in the family business. I won't bore you with details. I managed to arrive to the UK in January 2014 and I worked in the luxury fashion industry until last year. I was struggling with PTSD and volunteering in refugee camps and seeing how bad the situation was getting there wasn't wasn't really helping with my mental health. And last year, I remembered my grandfather who, who taught me beekeeping and natural beekeeping. And I got my first hive and I realized instantly the therapeutic aspect of keeping bees. It was Keeping bees was like, did actually really help me overcome a lot. Uh, but like beekeeping really helped me overcome a lot. And th that's how the idea of bees and refugees came to be. I realized that bees are endangered, refugees are under attack, and that bees and refugees could actually work and support each other to help each other. So we, I created Bees and Refugees. I quit my job last year and I started Bees and Refugees in the purpose of offering therapeutic workshops to other refugees that are suffering from similar symptoms. And then lockdown happened and we also realized that so many local communities where our beehives are placed could also benefit from such an activity. So, you know, bee beekeeping uh, teaches confidence and trust and it, it teaches acts of kindness. And then of course the bees also, there are so many lessons to learn from the bees. So it, it bees strive for unity and that is perhaps the biggest lesson that we could learn that we need to come together and work together in order to overcome the challenges that we have right now. And back to you, Jackie. Thank you so much again for hosting me and thank you for all the work, the great work you've done. So after speaking, I visited Ali and he showed me one of his hives and I asked him, a lot of my work has text on it. So I asked him if there are any particular words that I could incorporate on the enameled surfaces. And he came up with two phrases, which was one was breaking borders and the other one was freedom of movement. And as well as providing me with some text that could go on the piece, it actually helped me. I couldn't work out what form to, to make my original piece. 
so I tried out, I asked them about different tools and I made an outline of a, a smoker and that didn't work. And then when he came up with those two phrases, I thought, well, and also in one of the, the, the group discussions we had with the, the commoning group, Deidre Nelson said, oh, your work's about mapping. And I was thinking, is it? Oh, uh, I hadn't noticed that. Um, so thank you, Deirdre. That really helped. So I, I made a map, but I took the ordered structure of the beehives and I, I wanted them to disrupt them to make an outline. So the first piece, the piece on the left, the black piece, that's an outline of, of Syria. I ended up simplifying it a lot because it ended up being so complicated. And that's got the words of breaking borders, freedom of movement. And then I also had asked Ali if he had anything that was important from him from Syria. And he had this lovely photograph of some graffiti. And Ali, I, I can't remember. So you said that it's words to the effect of this country's beautiful, but it's broken. Is that um, right? Uh, it's, it says uh, it's a graffiti. It's a very old graffiti that's written in Damascus. And it says, uh, I love this this place that I don't know how to translate it literally. It's like, I love this place, no matter how burned it is. It's something like that. I've taken different elements from from there, but this this is a, a blown up version. And then the other piece zoomed out and this shows the landmass of, of Africa and the Middle East and then Europe, tracing the journey of, of um, that Ali has taken and the other refugees. And it's, Oh, this has got the, the bees and the honey, but also water and different colours from, from that. And it's got text about the bees. So looking at what unifies the, the, the refugees, we've all got very different experiences and the importance of both the environmental thing of, of that Ali is, is interested in supporting, you know, the, the, the bees who are also struggling at the moment. Okay, thank you. So we'll move on then round the corner to um, Linda Brothwell. Um, so Linda's work um, is called, titled Acts of Care, Bench Repair Project. Uh, so what you see on the right hand side is some bench slats um, exactly made to measure for um, different parks in Bristol, different park benches rather in Bristol. And that's where the bench slats will return to um, once uh, they've finished touring. And um, on the next to that, on the left-hand side, there's um, a plinth, tabletop plinth with photographs of an original project, which was the first iteration of the bench repair project, which took place in Lisbon. And um, there, um, Linda was repairing benches, learning Portuguese techniques of inlay. So inlay has become a kind of theme of her work and she hand makes the tools that she works with. And above the bench, uh, above the um, um, tabletop case there it is a, a, a case with two panels, two wooden panels with some beautiful handmade tools for um, inlay work um, hung onto those um, wooden panels. And there's a little um, audio clip, um, which has not just Linda speaking, but also has Layla. Those of you who were at the symposium earlier on will have heard Layla Dorney, um, who was co-hosting the symposium. Layla and Linda um, collaborated together going on walks. They both live in Bristol, so they were walking around the parks together, having conversations about repair and dilapidation and public life, public space. Thanks, Deirdre. That's great. Um, I'm just going to talk very briefly about, about our collaboration and then Linda's going to talk a little bit more about the work itself. So just for a bit of context, Linda and I met through the Crafting the Commons network and I'm a cultural geographer at the University of Exeter and my research is, is kind of on the emotional and material aspects of large scale economic and social change. So how in this context, how is our world in common? How is the idea of the public 
changing after 30 years of, of neoliberalism and 10 years of austerity. So that's related to what Deirdre was talking about, about the context of this exhibition at the beginning. So when I was introduced to Linda, it was, it was incredibly excited because we were both thinking about the importance of public things and how these things were changing and also our ethical relationship to these things. So we started basically having a, a series of conversations that were walking conversations around the city of Bristol, where we both live. And these took place in December and January last year. And each, each one was based around a theme. So we talked for one week about care and responsibility and for one week about maintenance and attention. So we were thinking very much about our ethical relationship to objects and the life of the objects themselves. And we also talked about dilapidation and austerity, how things fade and decay, and infrastructure and public life. So these conversations formed the background of, of the collaboration. And we returned again and again to this idea of, of public things that support us, that hold us, that give us a sense that we're being looked after. And in our walks around the city, we kept noticing that some of the older, well-made, comfortable benches that we were sitting on and walking past were being replaced by these very cheap, cold, uncomfortable ones. And we started thinking about the metrics of this bottom line that is being applied to public things and imagining what happens if they were different? What would happen if care and connection and holding were the means by which public things were valued and measured rather than in terms of how little can we get this thing for? How can we tick this box on the sheet? So that was the, the context really about thinking about the things that we have in common that hold us in some way. Linda, over to you to talk about the work. Uh, so I was going to introduce the work in the exhibition a little bit. So for over 10 years, my project Acts of Care has become this continuously growing single body of work with many iterations now created all around the world. For me, it's the anchor of my practice. It brings me home and it allows me to use tools and to kind of censor myself so Acts of Care as a project considers what it means to make something by hand that takes care as the core. So to not only make the thing, but to make the tools that make the thing. And often this leads me to spend months or years immersed in the techniques or the materials or the stories of a place. So there are two parts to the work in this exhibition. There is a loaned piece of work, which is the original bench repair project tools and shadow board. This was originally created for the UK Pavilion at Experimenta Biennial by uh, commissioned by British Council. And then there's this new iteration, which is for Bristol in 2021, commissioned by Craftspace for this exhibition. So staying with the first one just for a second, this first bench repair project was in 2009. It was a citywide project where I replaced the broken wooden slats with new ones in Lisbon. I learned wood inlay there and then used this skill to execute a citywide repair project on the public benches, inlaying them at that point with traditional Portuguese patterns and icons, so democratizing the access to high craft. Each of the tools that I needed to create that work was specific to me. So they're specific to my hands, to the particular portability that I needed to be able to work on street benches. And so I designed and made them for that specific project. So in this exhibition, the tools are presented here on this inlaid shadow board. Each tool has its home. So it has the shadow that's inlaid in ebony and each tool is created to perform a very, very specific action. From working with Layla in 2020 and into this year as well, we started to identify these common areas of interest that Layla's spoken about, of feeling held, of public care, of how you kind of walk through the landscape with which you live. So from this, I was inspired to use this visual language of repair in these new bench slats, which are in this exhibition, and so to remove these traditional design language and to replace it instead with a democratized hint of repair language. So these patches and stitches and things like this, which shows the beauty in the trace of the hands and caring for spaces. Each of these wooden bench slats that you can see here is specific to a bench slat in a, in a park in Bristol that needs repairing and needs replacing. 
and these are the benches that I've walked past with Layla and we've kind of identified over our walks around the city. So these bench slats are inlaid, they are different hardwoods, they're different sizes, but everything is incredibly specific to the bench that it's that it is aiming for. And it's working as a kind of offering to the future, so to a time when we can sit and share in public space again. Whilst these pieces are on show here, I will continue to make these slats and to install them in parks in Bristol. And these there's drawings in the exhibition as well, which are a bit of the planning behind how these patches and stitches and things can work together. So this is part of the planning work. And as an additional part of this work, we have also worked with a video maker called Finbar Marcel, who was inspired by the ideas of the piece to create a new video piece, which Great, thank you, Emma. Um, it's worth remembering as we go around on this tour that all this work was made during lockdown, during the first lockdown, when you know the the longest lockdown, and um, so all the artists were working under really difficult, challenging personal circumstances, and you know, so times when studios were closed and people just had to sort of make do um, with what they had, the resources they had. Um, so this is Rachel Coley. Um, what we see is a series of um, neck pieces made from organic materials, um, food waste um, and, and fabric cord. And Rachel's work is really about um, challenging the throwaway um, culture of costume jewellery. Um, and so these, she, she's um, worked with um, her local authority to forage materials from parks and a common common land and common spaces that would otherwise, um, you know, be thrown away or not used, um, but harvesting that and then doing this amazing material exper experimentation, innovation um, to make up these new, um, new um, boards and sheets of materials um, that she's made into necklaces. And they were, these necklaces will um, have a limited lifespan and they're designed to sort of return to the land and to biodegrade, you know, as fashion changes. So thinking about also respecting the end of an object's life and creating a new sort of ritual in letting it go and recognizing the value of craftsmanship in that moment of making. But there's some fascinating materials that she's used, all natural. Um, and it's, it, it, it's um, Rachel will continue this uh, materials research and experimentation. It's really interesting um, series of work that she's making and quite new work really. So we move on to um, an installation by a couple of artists who've worked together in Norway. So they've collaborated. Um, so Gelawesh Walid Kani and Lise Bjorn Linnet have worked together with, on a new project with undocumented migrants in Norway. And um, they basically, because of lockdown, couldn't meet in person. Um, they met in person sometimes outside, but they set up this idea of drawing tables um, where people would come together either online virtually through Zoom or, or such means or outside in parks. And um, they set them up simultaneously in Oslo, Trondheim and Bergen um, and invited people who um, you know, usually sort of remain very hidden and frightened and don't have a stake in society um, to connect, to share memories and stories uh, through these drawing rooms and drawing tables um, and collected this fantastic series of work. You can see lovely handmade brushes on the table, brushes made from nature, from leaves. You can see leaves which are embroidered um, hand sewn, hand stitched leaves. You can see drawings, um, different sort of drawings with colours, with pencil, with charcoal. You can see poetry, you can see writing. So it's all a very rich set of um, expressions and um, working through really ideas about belonging um, and, and feelings. Um, and the, the treatment of the leaves, for example, symbolises how they wish to be sort of you know seen and treated with love and with care there's a great deal of slowness and 
in stitching and, and care in stitching something like a leaf that's so fragile and you know could crumble in your hands. Um, there's an audio piece, I mean there's a video piece that sits in the middle of the table and that just shows, gently shows people working and talking and being together and, and commoning together. If you go, if you come back to look at that separately, there's a really nice audio piece that goes with that. Um, so carrying on around the gallery to um, take, we take takes us to Mexico and to the work of Claudia Rodriguez, um, who collaborated with Ana Joaquina Ramirez and Rosina Santana Castello, um, and this is called the Next Project. So. Um, it's about really the power of community action um, around a very polluted river, a river that belongs to everyone, a, a major artery um, for agriculture, for industry, for farmers. And um, they worked with 400 people, over 400 people, along with several communities, rural communities, urban communities, but all along the polluted Santiago river in Guadalajara in Mexico. Um, and through a long process of showing and uh, sharing making skills through finger knitting, um, they've worked up, made this monumental 150 meter long weave. Um, and the white part of the weave is based on the sort of polluted froth that appears on the river. Um, and they processed the weave through uh, on a route which raised awareness uh, uh, whilst speaking and um, protesting um, and raising awareness of uh, making a plea really to government agencies to clean up this river and for people to um, become stewards, better stewards for a shared natural resource. Um, and um, it was followed with um, public discussion and poetry afterwards. So there's a video uh, there's a film that we played at the symposium earlier, some of you may have seen it, but it, it, it's a beautiful film. Um, and there's a sample of the weave in the exhibition as well. And then for part of the exhibition, we had um, three um, on-site residencies, three site-specific residencies with three partners. So this residency was with the Heart of Glass, an organisation in um, Hel in St Helens in Mer Merseyside and it's with the artist Kate Hodgson who's a, a printmaker. Um, the project is called Party, so it, it's working with women in PAR and so it's called Party, P-A-R-R-T-Y um, and it's basically um, a project to engage young women in PAR in coming together to common and think about um, future imaginary really imagining their future, what's important to them, um, what resources they might like to create uh, and what resources they already share in part. And so it, it's a zine project and Kate has produced the first zine which is being sent out to young women in part. Um, and then when they return uh, with some provocations in the questions uh, and then when they return their answers and they because they haven't been able to get together physically yet, um, would have been a physical residency, but so they're doing it through an exchange of zines and then a second zine and a third zine will be created and published and, and become a, you know, the means for, for exchange and, um, and the means for uh, commoning together. Uh, and we hope as the project progresses, and it's still ongoing, that they'll be able to meet in person and that this project continues and, and the exhibit will change and, and um, you know, become live with content of things that they're producing. And so we uh, travel into gallery two and uh, um, ahead of us, we see um, a huge textile piece made of um, straw. So it's little bundles of straw that have been tied up together and stitched um, laboriously with a lot of labour stitched onto a big long piece of hessian that drapes onto the floor and beside it are two vessels um, which are also uh, made their vessels um, that are, are shaped by hand um, and um, are containers of 
um, stories, they held the, they held stories, they held the little bits of um, straw that become like scrolls of, of memory and scrolls of story. Um, so this is um, Falsland and it's uh, straw, wax, hessian, threads and paper. And um, we, um, Emma, are we doing an audio clip of this one? So it's called um, New Land. And I think we're going to do an audio clip of this. I made this piece a few years ago after working on an estate in East London um, for several years, claiming pieces of unused land and turning them actually into a series of allotments and places for meeting and gathering. And what really moved us was how the elemental material of the soil or the plants actually produced all these incredible exchanges between people and how the material had its own agency because it brought people to speak and brought people to feel that they had a common connection with each other. So we thought, how does this work if we're actually not sort of connected directly to a space that is a garden or a land? And how does it work if we work with an ordinary material and bring that material out of context and start working with it in a public space? So we sat with some scales on a little wooden raft on a, a busy street in East London called Hoxton Street, where there's many different cultures, as well as a lot of really old school East Enders, some of which who've never left their immediate area. And we sat there with these piles of straw and we positioned them between us, passing one, one tray, which you can see there's some carriers there, also these vessel objects, one tray bit from one of us to the other. And as we were doing this, we were actually humming. So we sat there on the street and we passed the straw through the palms of our hands and these bundles started to form. And as we rolled one bundle, another was rolled by the hands of someone who passed us by. And these sounds and these bundles became this kind of collective and repetitive act. And what was really beautiful is that through this process, something really simple started growing into something which was collecting all of these stories. And at the beginning, we, we, didn't, we had this instinct of rolling this straw and working with this material in a particular way to create something that was beautiful. But at the time, we didn't know what that would look like. And we were really moved about how many people came over to us and said, I know what you're doing. This is something in my culture that happens all the time. And then they proceeded to tell us all of these stories about how it connected them to their homeland and how it connected them to their ancestors. So all of the bundles then in a way are actually imbued with all of these stories. So we, we came to call the piece the new land, which is in honor of all of these stories that people have and visions that they have together. And then we spent a very, very long time sewing them onto the, onto the Hessian. And there was something really beautiful about that sort of secondary process. So the first process of making was in a public space and the crafting itself, which is normally hidden, was actually then revealed. And how could that become a way of bringing people together? And then the second process was this really time consuming, repetitive labor of repairing the bundles, remembering the stories, sewing them on into a particular formation and how that sort of honored actually the journeys that we had been with all the people. And then we came to think a lot about how there's something about the labor of these common spaces or, and the time that participants or people that you meet through these projects can actually be honored by this action of craft that takes a lot of time and love to actually bring it together in a piece. So I guess that's something we were working with with this. I think it's the, of all the sculptures we've made, it is the one that took the longest amount of time. We sat on the... Okay, so we're going to move, um, move on now to Ellie Carpenter, because time is running on. Um, so Ellie Carpenter has um, two pieces in the exhibition, um, but all of them um, focus around a project called the Embroidered Digital Commons. Um, so here we see on the wall 
um, little patches of embroider embroidery, little separate patches, um, all embroidered with words, different sorts of words. And um, basically, um, the, um, Ellie worked with the Rax Media Collective, who came up with a sort of lexicon for the digital commons, a very poetic, beautiful lexicon. And the lexicon had a number of um, terms in it, what, what Ellie calls terms. And she set out over 10 years to invite groups of people to stitch each of the terms. And so she split each of the terms up into sentences and very short paragraphs. And then it was distributed out and each term was stitched by a group of people coming together for different reasons and in different contexts and different spaces. And so over 10 years, most of the terms have been completed. Um, so there are two, one term that we've borrowed um, is called fractal, and that's um, the two pieces on a brown background that you see in the corner. So that, that was an existing piece that we have loaned. And then the new piece is um, that you see hanging um, like bunting across the gallery in the formation of bunting is called portability. So that was a term that hadn't yet been stitched, and we thought portability was very nice with the touring show. Um, and so we brought together a group of stitchers in Birmingham and they stitched the term portability, um, which um, now joins the, the body of work. And there's a fantastic website that Ellie has about the embroidered digital commons. So, um, you know, you can look that up a bit more. And so we are moving to um, a sculpture. Um, and this is um, called Tree, it's by Blackwater Polytechnic. So what we're looking at is a sculpture that has um, a sort of amorphous shape. Um, it has wooden, a metal body, and it has sort of wooden um, branches coming out from it. It has um, zigzag um, uh, paperwork uh, attached to the body. It's very colourful uh, and it also has um, textile um, knitted words that are hanging from the branches and it also has a linked chain of pieces hanging from the branches um, and that's, uh, this is a collective of artists and if I can invite Ben Kood Adams who's one of the artists in the collective from the Blackwater Polytechnic to join us. Hi Ben. Hello. Hi. Um, so, I mean, when this arrived with us, um, it, was a, it was a lovely surprise because it was typically of you and of the group and of Freddie Robbins quite, it felt quite anarchic in a way, you know, it felt quite um, also, it's the most colourful piece in the show and it, it did feel a bit discordant and I thought that, and that's wonderful because it felt kind of a bit disruptive, which is sort of what you were saying earlier, you know, something, there are tensions in the commons. Um, and so do, was that partly the intent in, um, or, or was it very planned piece or, or did people do their own thing and then it came together? Um, people did their own thing and it came together. So it was, <laughs> um, but so I, Freddie, and Sarah's piece, so the knitted words and the chain of quotations were already made. So we knew that we had to hold them up somehow. And so, um, and I like this idea, I did, I did, I like the idea of using a tree form with branches because we're surrounded by trees. We're a, we're a, the commons in the country and uh, all of us grew up within eight miles of here and live within three miles of here so we're geographically very located in rural countryside and um, uh, we all exist in slightly different worlds so uh, I, I do kind of um, blacksmithing, Freddie is well known in the textile world, Sarah Impey is in the kind of subset of that of kind of tapestry, so she's very well known in the tapestry world. In America she's, you know, very successful and, and Justin Knopp who made the paper 
streamers uh, is really well known as a letterpress artist. And Simon Emery, who did the spray painting, uh, is a, he, he converts VW Beetles into 1970s drag racing cars and sprays them up beautifully. And so that, um, so we're all kind of at the top of our game in our own fields, but we really like the idea of showing together. So bringing those worlds together. So, so you, you're building audiences by involving different worlds. Um, yeah. Thank you. And um, I think that's the piece that you're the biggest collective in the exhibition. And um, it, it, there are a lot of raises questions about um, cultural commons, you know, value of cultural commons and also the, um, the kind, yeah, those um, tensions, you know, the various tensions of the commons as well and the creativity, autonomy and creativity and all of those things. Um, so I think, you know, having an artistic led piece in that way. I think it has been really enriching actually because it does stand out, you know, among the, it, it lends something quite interesting to the show. It's a, it got a very different dynamic. So um, thank you for that, Ben. You're welcome. Okay, so we're going to move on to Pinky McClure, who is a stained glass artist um, based up in Scotland. And so her commentaries is quite um, related to the place that she lives in um, and um, so the one on um, the one on the left is uh, called Lament for the Seas on a Great Orc um, and that really is about highlighting issues of pollution and exploitation of the ocean which she feels very strongly about and I think which is um, something about commons and commoning that is becoming more and more um, important because um, you know, some things belong to all of us, like like the oceans, and so the the rapid commodification and of them and the the, the deep mining of them is, is really co concerning her um, and concerning a lot of people. And so it's a piece that tries to think about um, the urgency of the need to adopt a more sustainable way of living um, and of heating our houses and. You know, clothing and feeding ourselves, so that it's it's quite an issue-based piece, but also uh, incredibly beautiful and detailed uh, and rich in its making. And then the other piece, rewilding at the Clutie tree, on the right-hand side. So these are large um, stained glass panels for for those who are following the captions. Very colourful, very detailed imagery. Rewilding the Clutie has um, beautiful. Um, um, birds that are um, going in endangered birds in endangered, particularly endangered species of butterflies and other um, uh, other creatures. And so this is really also a commentary about um, rewilding, really an interest in reclaiming once common land, which I think was talked about at the conference today about um, reclaiming things that were once common and how do we how do we do that? How do we return them to um, think about futuring them into better conditions that are more harmonious and um, not so extractive that are, you know, more, um, more empowering for both the species and for the people who interact with, with those as well. So that's Pinky. And then we move on to um, Common Agency Projects, um, which is made up of Shane Waltoner and Laura Glasser, who work together um, in, in, um, in deep lockdown. They worked um, outside, they chose to explore ideas of commoning in nature. So nature as a form of commons. And um, there are two pieces, there's a stone piece and a willow piece. Um, so you see a basket um, on a platform um, with stones in it, um, which are um, collected by Shane. And um, you see in the film that they created, you see what, so visitors are meant to stand on the platform 
and put the sto stones into two piles and then follow the actions on the film. So to work together. It's called um, standing your commoning action 14, how to stand your ground generously. And it takes you through um, a collaborative action in nature. So making the two circles into one eventually, basically. And then um, the other willow piece. Uh, so as the exhibition tours, we alternate the two pieces. So sometimes it'll be the stones and sometimes it'll be the willow. Uh, and the willow is also a beautiful um, interactive piece where two people work, two visitors work with each other. Um, they, um, one person stands and uh, the willow on the shoulders of the other person and keeps building it up. So there's a point at which initially you need to hold the willow up, you're the person holding it up. But by the end, by the time the willow is interlocked around your body, um, you're able to duck down and, and step away from, from it. So initially you're being held by it and then it, hold, and then it holds itself. So it's about nature holding us, which is what um, Linda was talking about earlier, about the, the value of being held and, and that we need to recognize how much, um, especially in the pandemic, that nature has, has held us, given us, has held that space for us and given us so much. And so now we come to um, Common Ground Project, which is uh, Alice, McLean and Justine Boussard. We've got Justine with us. Have we, Justine, are you there? Hello, yes, I'm here. Justine, okay. So if I just describe, um, we've got two showcases and then um, we're looking at, um, in, into the showcase, you will see basically um, set two different sets of tokens, um, a set of tokens in brass, uh, etched brass, and another set of tokens from, which are etched onto uh, metal and um, they're both from different projects and then that held above the clipped above the showcase is various bits of ephemera that relate to um, each of the projects so there are two projects here overall the project is called common ground but there's the peck and rye common um, token project um, which was the original project and then a uh, a special project that took place um, based in Birmingham with the um, allotment holders of the Walsall, Hull, Walsall Road allotments who um, fought to save their allotments from the Commonwealth Games development. So sets of tokens were the partly the outcome, weren't they, of these? But um, what was interesting, what ties all the work together, Justine, was something about, which I think is a very powerful idea that you and Alice work with, is in the notion of being a good ancestor. Um, and that ties up both these projects, if you could tell us a bit about that. Yes, exactly. So the, the tokens are very much commemorative tokens. The first one that you see now commemorates the, um, the acquisition of Peckham Rye Common, which is in southeast London, by the local vestry in 1868, uh, which marked the moment where it was um, preserved and saved against uh, encroachment and being developed over. Um, and the second token on the other side, and I, I very much like the fact that they are back to presented back to back, almost like they're the two sides of the same of the same coin. Um, the other token, as Deirdre was explaining. Um, commemorates the preservation of the Walsall Road allotments in Perry Bar, Birmingham, which were saved again um, against demolition by a group of, uh, of local plot holders in 2019. And so we were really keen to show that the acts of commoning need to happen across several generations. So we, although they happen in two different chronologies, we really see them as linked. So we are now, we can now really benefit from what happened seven generations ago 
with um, the preservation of the Peckham Rye Common, but actually it's really interesting to start and think, okay, so the preservation of, of the allotments, what is that going to do in 175 years? And it's really actually interesting to see with the, uh, the pandemic um, that back, you know, if you think about what was happening at the time of the commons preservation movement, people were fighting to preserve commons and they were setting up parks because people were living in, in, in very cramped conditions, there were uh, infectious disease in cities, and, and history is often very cyclical, isn't it? So it was interesting to see that actually seven generations later, we are again facing a similar kind of problem, and it's the solutions that were put in place seven generations ago, seven generations ago that are helping us through it. So it'll be interesting to see what, uh, what happens uh, 175 years into the future, and what will the impact of the acts of commoning of today be then? Mm. No, I think that's a really nice sort of uh, a nice play on uh, it's sort of the import. I think your project really encapsulates the importance of um, looking back in history and learning from history and, and taking from it, but actually using that to to make new imaginaries, to 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 make new to you know to make new commons, to make sense, um, but actually um, yeah, re reclaiming uh, understanding the past in order to to claim the future. Uh, yeah, it's a really nice idea. Really yeah. look forward and, and learn how to care, uh, deeply mm. care for future generations by looking at the past and what people have done for us previously. Yeah, great. Thanks, Justine. Thank you. Okay, so we move on to Alina Azadeh, who was here earlier on the um, symposium. And this was, um, this artwork um, comes out, it's, it's actually a digital um, resource, an online resource called Craft in Common. And it should have been a physical residency in March 2020 in Balsall Heath in Birmingham. So we were we had three residencies around the country, as I mentioned, um, the Heart of Glass one, the Birmingham one. And then you'll see the next one was in uh, Oriel Davis in, in Wales. Um, but we weren't able to do the residency. So Alina had to think on her feet and we worked together to create this online um, resource. So Craft in Common. And there are five different makes. Um, and Alina worked on making videos in her attic um, of, um, based on the emotional commons really, she's very, she has very powerful things to say about the emotional commons and the importance of the emotional commons. And she's used five craft uh, making processes really to explore emotions of um, courage, care, or emotions or experiences, courage, care, um, connection, um, repair and um there's a fifth one can't remember what it is now loss loss that's right um so um there's a make for each of these and what's interesting is that in retrospect um we, we sort of put it out there in about june time and people started using it um some people share, put their courage medals in public places some people gave them to other people, gifting them. Some people kept them for themselves. So it's recognizing every day, small acts of courage. And we then um, are now, then we then did work, Zoom workshops with those, um, with the different groups that we would have worked with in Birmingham. So the case, in the case, you'll see uh, medals that have been made by people uh, on Zoom workshops or medals that were made and sent in to us. Um, and then for Black History Month, we also, uh, we're able to use this commoning resource to reclaim something of black history by um, inviting young um, uh, early career, five early career artists to nominate a black person of their choice and to make a courage medal um, for that person to give to them. Um, but it, what it revealed was some really fascinating stories about um, pioneers, about inspiration, about who these young makers have looked to for their strength and, and their courage and how they recognize the um, racial struggles of, of earlier pioneers like Frank Bowling and um, like their own grandparents. Um, so that was a really uh, moving and interesting way to reclaim um, black heritage. Okay, so then we move on to um, Kevin Jones, who's this, what we see here is um, a little tabletop 
display with some uh, magazines, some hand-printed zines, um, some uh, graphics on paper, um, and it's an ongoing project that's um, just recently started really again because of lockdown it was very delayed so the process is ongoing but Heaven Jones uh, like um, with the Heart of Glass and like St Helens um, his remit was to work with young people um, and the Oriel Davis Gallery so uh, it's called the ODG Assembly and the project is basically to have been working with young people to facilitate them to um, creatively explore issues that they care about and then develop connections into the gallery to use the gallery in new ways to connect with each other but also to uh, kind of to to occupy uh, the spaces and the thinking and the, the presentation spaces in the gallery for a youth voice and um, to think about creative acts of commoning and, and ways that they can um, think about the world they live in and, and share that with others. So there's a little bit of audio that goes with this. Our lost and losing birds, corncrake, skylark, cuckoo and snipe, woodcock, curlew, flycatcher, quail, lapwing, nightingale, turtle dove, wryneck and nightjar. The air was warm with the earthy scent of freshly made clay. With your eyes closed, the room was more a damp meadow or marsh and gallery, even as fog hung heavy outside the water beaded window. Okay, so just a snippet and it's on a rolling, uh, the audio is on a, a kind of rolling basis, so it cycles around. Um, but the, the young people uh, spoke very nicely on the audio clip um, when we had, we've got an audio clip there of them explaining about their environmental passions, their activist um, sort of um, interests. Uh, and it was really moving, actually. Um, so um, last but not least, we come to Amy Twigger Holroyd. Not, I mean, we've got one more other person to go to, but this is second last work. And we have Amy on the call. Um, so Amy has two works in the exhibition. One's an existing um, work that uh, began uh, this kind of journey. Um, so with, with, with commons and commoning and thinking about um, fashion, fashion commons and, fa and the enclosure of fashion. So um, this artwork that we're looking at is a series of pictures of um, jumpers which have been um, hacked into and repurposed uh, with mends and repairs and um, alterations, which show that fashion doesn't have to be enclosed. You can actually um, remake and restitch and, and hack into it and uh, and repurpose the fashion and then there's an example so that's like a sampler what you see is the picture were, were samples of, of different techniques that you can uh, that everyone can use and then a, a, a cardigan here that shows um, all the different repairs and the different alterations that that one can do um, on the on garments like that so um, the, the, it's the re-knit revolution project um, but we'll move on from that to look at Amy's current work, which is called, uh, the new work for the exhibition, um, is called A Temporary Outpost of the Blue Fashion Commons. And um, what you can see is a wooden structure, which was made by Ben Coode Adams, who's on the call. And on that wooden structure, is a lot of blue clothing um, folded up and placed on the structure um, with an invitation. There are tool bags. Um, hanging down with books that say mend and little tools, scissors, sewing equipment, um, which you can approach the approach the, the benches and um, pick a piece of um, clothing, either bring one to swap or, or use one and um, and do some repairs. But uh, we've got Amy on the call and Amy um, will tell us more about the idea of the Blue Fashion Commons. Yeah, so I suppose this was... Um... I, I just I wanted to set myself the challenge of trying to create, could I design a commons, could I set something up that, that would kind of work as a commons and people would, and, and how would, I guess, pose the question of how people would uh, respond to it. Um, and so a, a project I've been uh, developing is called Fashion Fictions, where I invite people to imagine alternative fashion worlds. So this is one of the fashion, this is kind of an embodiment of one of the fashion fictions, uh, which is a world where um, blue clothes can no longer be bought and sold, they can only be exchanged. 
Um, and so these hubs have kind of developed where people are kind of um, developed intensive uh, swapping practices, um, which of course then necessitates repair. If, if no more blue clothes can be produced, then that material become, you know, takes on a different value um, and the, the repair of them becomes more important. So the idea is that this has been sort of transposed from this parallel world is offered here um, as something that isn't a, a static um, um, thing. It, it's, a, it's a working kind of installation and invitation uh, that, you know, the ideal would be that it, it, it kind of um, evolves and changes as people come along. Um, if they bring an item of clothing or they spend time working on the resource, um, sorting things out, tidying it up, mending things if they need mending, um, then it will, um, they, they're allowed to take a blue item away. So it's a kind of um, an experiment and a question of, will this work? Uh, are we, do we have the necessary kind of um, skills or, or uh, ways of thinking that will enable us to kind of engage in this, in this challenge of, of becoming a blue fashion commoner? That's really, and I, I love the idea of the bringing back the folk motif. So, um, there's something you say, Amy, about um, rejecting the, um, in this world, um, um, the label, the, the sort of, what do you call it, that you explain it? The... Yeah, so, you know, as, as um, uh, commercial production and sale of garments has been uh, banned, um, uh, people, how, their, their feelings towards kind of marks of that commercial production have changed, and so people are actually rejecting kind of logos and naff graphics that don't really mean anything and that they're, they're drawing on another kind of commons a kind of um the commons that you could describe of um folk embroidery which are from um english smocks um the beautiful embellishments that are on on english smocks and these have taken on a new life people have started kind of adding them uh, to their clothing so there are uh, various embellished pieces um kind of hiding within in the commons that of course have been transported from the parallel world. And we've got an instructable that um, uh, guides you in how to do it yourself if you're now looking at the blue clothes in your own wardrobe in a different way. Yeah, and um, we hope that, um, you know, when we get into a less restricted post-COVID time that, um, that, that when it gets to Leicester, that when you next see this piece um, in the physical form, that it will be much messier and people will have used it and it won't be so neatly folded uh, and it remains to be seen you know whether how do how will people kind of control or not control you know this um how will they behave when when there's no i mean there are some parameters but will they break the rules will will, will people take the best pieces or will, will they leave them for others will they behave in the way that you know thinks they're going to or not so i think it'll be fascinating to um you know, Ben was talking earlier in the symposium about things being fluid and, uh, and unfixed and, um, you know, not being a static piece. And it, it, your intention here, Amy, was just to be very much engaged with and be a living, changing, you know, piece and that, that it would be different in each place in the sense that, that when people come with it, that there should be some interesting repairs and some, you know, they should leave behind a bit of themselves. Um, so that would be interesting. Thank you very much, Amy. Uh, and um, last but not least, we, we come to the final work before we left the gallery. So this is um, Deirdre Nelson, who was also at the symposium earlier. I think we should have Deirdre with us. Are you there? Deirdre? Yes, I'm here. Yeah. Okay. Um, so what we're looking at are, is a wall-based piece. Um, in the center is a beautiful round, uh, circular, um, embroidered textile piece, very beautiful, subtle. Um, colours of, of hand-dyed, um, uh, uh, hand-dyed um, threads, and um, it's a map, basically little red dots on it, and emerging from the red dots are threads which radiate out to smaller little discs, um, little circles of hand-embroidered um, uh, pieces, each of which, so the, the title of the piece is, is Guild of Commoning. So the, the central piece is, is the map, and then you have the individual guild, um, what do you call the, the sort of little symbols of the guild, 
um, emanating from the center and pinned out to the edges. And then there's also a little, um, a little key, a little hand-stitched key, which um, lists all the different resources. So Deirdre, your, um, yours was a, a lovely piece uh, to end with in a way, because you were, you went to search for commons um, in your, like two, me, two kilometers from the tenement flat that you live in. And you went right back to your doorstep and you thought, let me look for the commoning that is happening around me and, and on my doorstep and in my community. And so we, we loved that you focused right back into, you know, to your the heart of your community that you're part of and, um, and discovered and was able to map all these different um, resources. So how would you characterize, can you give us a flavor of, of the different sorts of resources that you found and how they enable this kind of um, connect ideas of connection and care? Um, I suppose I, um, well, originally I thought of um, everything out with my apartment um, in Glasgow or my tenement flat, but then I realized that where I live is actually a form of commoning in itself. Um, for those of you who know Scotland and tenement living, you know, you live in a block with six flats and you share a garden and you share a, a back lane and things like that. And I realized that I needed to look at my own building in itself, first of all, and then from that started to, to look for projects that were more about acts of commoning rather than the, the commons. I think we've spoken about this a bit today in the in the symposium, but I looked at um, maybe sharing things uh, where there was a tool library, there was a, a toy library close by, and um, also looked at acts of, um, I suppose, repair, and um, there's Repair Cafe, which I'm involved in, which is within probably about a, the, about a mile and a half from my house. and. Um, also communal gardens, um, things where people were coming together to make things happen. There's quite a lot of uh, communal gardens. Um, craft projects, um, resources, craft and activism. Um, I'm trying to think of all the different things, but there were so many. And I think part of the problem towards the end was that there was, there was too much. I couldn't put everything on the map. And I think it's also an ever-changing map because these projects change and things happen and people move on. So um, I think there's a lot more that can be added. And hopefully after the exhibition, it could maybe come back to Glasgow and I can add those things to it. Yeah. And did you, and part of it was that what was your, you, your motivation also was to um, use dyes, use natural materials and use dyes, you know, make your own dyes. Yeah, so I used- Foraging um, in the local park. Yeah, the background fabric is um, a net made from nettle, so I, was, I thought it was really important to um, think of sort of um, the environment as our commons as well and protecting the environment. So I tried to do everything as environmentally friendly as possible. So the, the background fabric is made from nettle and the, not I didn't make it myself, but um, uh, and the threads are eco cotton, but they've been dyed with plants that I collected in my local park, which is just about, um, you know, less than half a mile from my house. So through collecting um, different, there was uh, like this one that's just brought up has got ivy and bramble um, that have created these two, two colors. So everything has been dyed, um, the bigger embroidery and the smaller badges are all embroidered with plants or, you know, plant dyed threads. Mm. Great. Oh, thank, thanks very much, Deirdre. Brief. You're welcome. Succinct. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, great. Okay. As Amy says, um, there are four instructables to have a go, up, go at, um, which uh, Deirdre was one of them, I think, weren't you? Um, so we're a bit over time and we've reached uh, the end of the tour. We started a little bit late, I think. But um, from Emma and I, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Please try and see the exhibition. Um, it's on this weekend at Oral Davis Gallery, and then it goes to the Leicester Gallery um, from July the 10th. Yeah, that's right. And then it's at the Devon Guild after that, and it continues. So do look up the tour. And um, the hashtag is we are commoners, if, if we'd love to hear your feedback. Um, and um, thanks very much again for joining us. Yes, thank you. So good night and have a good, enjoy the rest of your evening.
and uh, keep on commenting. <laughs>